Hello and welcome back to this low-level JavaScript series on building a 16-bit virtual machine from scratch. Today we're going to be using the assembly code parser that we wrote over the last few episodes to generate machine code, the stream of bytes that the virtual machine will read and interpret as instructions. We'll also be adding support for labels, which will allow us to give symbolic names to locations in the assembly code, and make writing loops and subroutines much easier. Of course, the assembly language is still missing quite a few features that we're going to need to come back and implement later, but right now I think it's good to shift our focus to keep the overall perspective. But before we dive into that, I want to mention that during the previous episode, I missed one of the instruction formats, and that was reglit. This type is actually used in three different instruction groups, the left and the right shifts, as well as one version of the subtract instruction. I've added this format and fixed the instructions already off camera. So in order to turn the information we get out of the parser about each instruction into a sequence of bytes, we need some meta information about that particular instruction. For example, we need to know which opcode it relates to, as well as how to encode its arguments. And for reasons that we'll see a little bit later, we're also going to want to know how many bytes this instruction will end up taking up in memory. We already have a little bit of this metadata in instructions.js, where we're mapping the internal name of each instruction to its opcode. Let's start out by doing a little bit of refactoring. First of all, let's make a directory called instructions and move our instructions.js file inside, renaming it to meta.js. Then we can take each instruction line and transform it to an object with an instruction and an opcode property. We'll take all of these objects and we'll put them in one array called meta. We can scroll down and delete the old module exports as well. Next, we need to attach information about what kind of format we're actually dealing with so that we know how to decode the instructions. We'll make an enum-like object called instruction types that will track all the different formats. Then we can add this metadata to each instruction on the key type. And just like I just mentioned, we're also going to want to keep track of the size of each instruction. The size is going to be determined by the format, so let's copy paste the instructions type object and rename it to instruction sizes. For lit reg, and indeed all instructions, the opcode takes up one byte. Then we have a 16 bit literal that takes two bytes. And lastly, a register, which is encoded in a single byte. That gives us four bytes in total for this instruction. Now, using that same logic, we can assign every other format its size in bytes. Then we can add a size property to every instruction in our meta array. And even though we're not going to use it today, let's also add a mnemonic group that each instruction is a part of. Now, from this file, we can export an object with meta as well as the instruction types. Next, we can create an index.js in the same directory, bringing in meta. And all we're going to do in this file is transform the array of object metadata into an object where every key is the internal instruction name and the value is the metadata. If you've watched the digital logic simulator video, then you'll recognize this operation as index by. So let's paste in the definition and export meta indexed by the instruction property. Now, because of this change, we're going to have to make another change in CPU.js. Because before this, instructions had the same keys, but they only had the opcode. And now the opcode is a property of an object. So we can go through all the cases in the execute method and add a dot opcode. All right, so we're almost ready to generate machine code. But first, we're going to have to make a proper parser. Currently, our assembly parser index.js has some testing code in it. We can actually delete everything but the instruction parser and bring in arc second. And essentially, what we need to do is create a parser that can capture not only a single instruction, but many instructions. And luckily for us, that's as simple as exporting a.many instruction parser, which will result in an array of instructions. And this is going to represent our AST. OK, so let's create an index.js file in assembler bringing in the parser that we just wrote, as well as the instructions, and then the instruction types from meta. 
I'll remap instruction types to just capital I to reduce noise in the code. We'll also need an object that maps register names to the values that they're represented by in machine code. There's at least one other place in the code where we do this, so it might be worth going back and refactoring this out to a common place. So that we can frame our thinking properly, let's write a simple program to test this out on. Let's use something like this. In the first instruction, we move hex value 4200 into R1, and then move the value at R1 to memory address hex 60. Then we move the hex value 1300 to R1, then load the value at hex 60 into R2, and finally we add R1 and R2 together. Nothing too exciting or terribly complex here. Just a little bit of register movement, some loads and stores to memory, and an arithmetic instruction. We can pass this program and create an array called machine code, which will hold all of the bytes that we end up generating. So what we're really going to be doing here is iterating through each passed instruction and generating a byte for its opcode, and then the bytes associated with each of its operands. Taking encoding a literal type operand as an example, lit here would be a node of hex literal type that's returned by the parser. And every node has a type property and a value. The parser actually just gives us a string. So funnily enough, we're going to have to use the parseInt function to get its actual numerical value using a radix of 16 since this is a hexadecimal number. Next, we're going to have to isolate the high and the low bytes of the number. And we can do this using bit masking and shifting to get both of those bytes. The high byte is the number anded with FF00 and then right shifted by 8 bits, a single byte. The low byte is the number anded with 00FF, or actually just FF. And we don't need to shift it because the result is already in the correct position. Now we just need to add those bytes to the machine code array. This VM is using a big endian encoding system, which means that when we have a number that's made of multiple bytes, the bytes that have the most significance come first. I chose this system because I think it's a little bit more natural for our brains to recognize this pattern, since bytes are laid out in the order that you would actually read them as a human being. But in CPUs and VMs, little endium, where the least significant bytes come first, is actually much more common. But for us, what we'll do is we'll push the high byte first and then the low byte second. And of course, this would be exactly the same if this were a memory address. So we can actually rename this function encode lit or mem. The instructions for left and right shift use a one byte literal. So we can copy this function, renaming it to encode lit eight and delete the high byte. We're still gonna be masking because the number that we've got in assembly code might actually be larger than 255. To encode a register, we'll just take a register type node and get its encoded value from the register map. And we'll push that straight into the machine code array. Now we have everything we need to be able to generate the complete machine code output. Let's assume passing was successful and we'll iterate through the results. We can get the metadata for this instruction using the internal instruction name that the parser gives us. Then we can immediately push the opcode into the machine code array. Now we just need to check the type property on metadata to see which instruction format we're actually dealing with, which is of course telling us how to encode the arguments. So for example, if it's a lit reg format instruction, then what we want to do is use encode lit or mem with the first argument and encode reg with the second. And the backwards comparison here isn't actually a mistake. I've done that for a reason, which will become clear in a second. If it's a reg lit format instruction, then we're going to encode the other way around, first encoding the register and then encoding the lit or mem, in this case lit. Reg lit eight would be the same, but we'll encode the literal using the encode lit eight instead. Reg reg would simply encode both arguments as registers. Reg mem, while technically a different format while we're parsing, is actually encoded exactly the same way as reg lit. So instead of a direct comparison, what we could do is we could put these two formats together in an array 
and use the .includes method of the array to see whether those types match the metadata. This is why I've done the instruction comparison this way around, so we can read all the format comparisons in the same way. And of course, the same thing goes for memreg, which is just the same encoding as litreg. Litmem uses encode lit or mem twice. And reg pointer reg has a shared encoding with regreg. Lit off reg, the only three operand instruction, encodes a literal or a memory address and then two registers. Single reg encodes just one register, and single lit encodes just one literal. And of course, we don't actually need to check for the no args format. All right, so let's test this out. If we log out the machine code array joined by a space, we should see some numbers. 16, 66, 0, 2, 18, etc. This is the decimal representation of our program which hopefully seems a little bit more familiar if we frame it in hex. So at first glance, this probably looks like nonsense, but if you order it so it matches up with the assembly, you'll start to see the structure actually emerge. We're gonna take the output and paste it into patron Max Star's awesome LLJS IDE project, which will let us load this program and visualize the registers, memory, the stack, and most helpfully, a human readable reconstruction of the assembly code. So all of the zeros in memory are just shown as dashes, which remove some of the visual clutter. The first instruction should load hex 4200 into R1. And if I click on step, we'll see that that is indeed what happens. The instruction pointer is updated to four, which is also visualized nicely in memory. The next instruction is going to move the value in R1 to memory address hex 60. After that, we move hex 1300 to R1, and then we move the value at address hex 60 into R2. Finally, adding R1 and R2 together, producing the expected result hex 5500 in the accumulator register. So the whole process now of parsing assembly code and then generating the machine code from the structured representation seems to be working correctly. Well, that's fine for a really simple program, but what if we wanted to write something a little bit more complex, something like this? Here we're using labels to give names to specific locations in memory without having to worry about what those exact addresses will end up being. And all the actual program is doing here is storing the number 10 in memory at address hex 50, and then beginning a loop where we first load the value at address hex 50 into the accumulator, then we decrement it and immediately save it back into memory. We increment the value R2 three times, and the final jump if not equal is asserting that if the accumulator is not equal to zero, then we're going to be jumping back to the address represented by loop. And of course, if it is equal to zero, then the flow is just gonna continue down to the halt instruction. Put another way, this code is essentially just a for loop. But in order to be able to run a program like this, we need to be able to pass labels. So let's first add a type for that in types.js. And then we'll add a parser in common.js. And labels are always in this form. So that's just a valid identifier followed by a colon. Let's use sequence of to capture the, the name with a valid identifier, then a colon, and then any optional white space. Then we can map once to extract just the name, and we'll map again to place it into its type. And then of course, at the end of this, we can export the label parser. And back in parser index, we can bring in that label parser and the parser that we export from here is going to become many choices between an instruction and a label. And now that we can pass labels, let's add the logic. I'll paste a new assembly language program in here, and just below the machine code array, I'll add an object called labels. This will act as our lookup table when we need to find a variable in place of an address or a hex literal. In order to populate this table, we're going to have to iterate through the past results, finding all the labels 
and then placing them inside the label lookup table with the address that they represent. Let's add this mutable variable called current address below and it will start at zero. Then we can iterate through the past results and check if we're dealing with a label. If we are, then we can add this as an entry into the label table with the current address. And if we're not, then it must be an instruction. And we can update the current address by getting the metadata for this instruction and adding the size to the current address. Now that we have all the labels resolved, we can edit encode lit or mem and create hex lit as a mutable variable. If lit type is a variable, then we can check if the label is defined in the table and of course throw an error if it's not. Otherwise, we can assign hex lit to the address associated with that label. And we can do exactly the same thing in encode lit 8, because even though all addresses are 16 bit, the first 256 addresses would still be accessible this way. It doesn't actually make much sense because this format is only used as a shift offset, but we'll keep it anyway for now. The only other change we need to make is that when we're iterating through the instructions in order to generate machine code, we need to check first to see if the type of the instruction is indeed an instruction. If it's not, because it's a label, then we'll just early return and skip this parser result. And that's actually it. So let's generate machine code again, and this time we get a little bit of a larger program, which makes sense. And we can copy and paste this into Max's IDE and step through. So we start by moving hex 0a into memory at address 0050. Now we're entering the code of the loop itself. So that's loading the value from memory into the accumulator, then decrementing it, and then moving that new value back into memory. Then we can increment R2 three times in a row. And then we come to the jump if not equal, where we're comparing the value inside the accumulator to the value that we've supplied in our code, which is zero. If the accumulator is not zero, we're going to jump back to the loop label, except now that loop label has become the resolved address 0005. So then we actually make the jump because we're not equal to zero and we're back in the move memory to register instruction. And there are a few more iterations to go here. So what I'll do is I'll set a breakpoint on the halt instruction by clicking it and changing the run delay to 100 milliseconds. And we'll just let the machine run itself. By the end, the value in R2 is hex 1e which is 30 in decimal. And this makes sense because this program was essentially a very convoluted addition multiplier where we multiplied three by 10. So after all of this, we can generate machine code directly from simple assembly programs, even ones that use labels to define meaningful units of code or subroutines. And if you've ever been frustrated by YouTube's algorithm not showing you when new low-level JavaScript videos are available, then feel free to check out tinyleather.com forward slash low level JavaScript to get new videos directly delivered into your inbox. Thank you to all of the patrons of low level JavaScript, including Max Starr, whose LLJS IDE we used here today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.